We're going to talk today about Thanksgiving. We're going to talk about the unseen that Joe's been preaching on the last five weeks, and we're going to talk about faith. But first of all, someone gave me a word earlier, and the word was from the Lord, and it was truth. So I want to share that with the church. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. Later in the Bible it says, know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It happens to be particularly important about what we're talking about today, because we're going to revisit the demoniac that Joe talked about last week, who was possessed. Christians can be oppressed, but not possessed. So we're going to revisit that. I don't know if you guys realize it, but the message from last week, there were technical difficulties, and it wasn't recorded, and it wasn't posted. So the Lord said to me, revisit that message and deliver it so it can be posted on the website. You see, God always wins. His will always prevails, no matter what. So we're going to do that. First, I want to talk a little bit about Thanksgiving. Did everybody have Thanksgiving? Was it a good Thanksgiving? Good. Stand up, and we're going to pray. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you humbly this morning, to the throne of grace, and we thank you for Thanksgiving that we celebrated. Lord God, move upon our hearts, our minds, and our spirit this morning that you would teach us precisely what you want us to learn, that we'd be filled to overwhelming with your reckless, overwhelming, never-ending love, Lord God, that we would come to meet Jesus if we don't know Jesus. Or if we are going through a storm and battling with issues in life, that we bring it to the throne of grace and ask for your will to be accomplished. We thank you for all that you have for us this morning, and we pray that you would touch each and every person in this church with your power, your wisdom, your truth, and your love. And we pray that in Jesus' name. We all agreed by saying, Amen. Amen. So... I had a phenomenal Thanksgiving. You know, I came, how many came here for this place Thanksgiving? Yeah, it was quite the spread. And, uh, you know, that went from 11 to 3. I had this brilliant notion that I would go to his place, Westminster, and then I would go to his place, Huntington Beach, from 5 to 7, and then I would end up my daughter's later. Well, I couldn't fit all that in, and thankfully, that's a good thing. So, yeah, I'm a double dipper for sure. So why are we thankful. Why do we celebrate Thanksgiving? I'm going to talk about every day should be Thanksgiving. Every day and every moment we should be thankful for what Christ has done for you and for me. Every day we should celebrate Christmas. Christ came to this earth, put on a man suit. Why? For you and for me. To save us to give us a life, and we should celebrate Easter and the resurrection every day, because it's through the risen Christ, the victory over death and sin, that we are who we are in the kingdom. You know, Joe talked last week about there's a kingdom banquet coming at the end of the age for all of us who know Christ larger than we can imagine. Can you imagine a banquet with all the heavenly fixings, with all the heavenly worship, with everybody there from the beginning of time till the end being served tremendous food? And guess what? We probably don't gain any weight in heaven. (laughs) So we could eat all the good stuff in heaven and not like have to go on a crash diet afterwards. So we're going to talk about Thanksgiving. You know, every time I go to a fellowship here for Thanksgiving, or I'm out there speaking to somebody about church, or I'm talking with you, the conversation comes up, why is his place special? Why is it unique? And I said, God, why is his place unique? You know, and I'm reminded, when you walk through the front doors in the lobby and you look to the wall on the right, I'm reminded of what it says. 
And I remember when I came here April 1st, 2012, when we moved to this church from the Huntington Beach Church, I was looking at all the things on the wall and I was struck by what it said. And Joe wrote that. Let me uh, tell you what it says if you don't know. In this church, we do real, we do mistakes, we do I'm sorry, we do second chances, we do fun, we do hugs, we do forgiveness, we do really loud, we do family, we do love. That is a great snapshot to describe what the Holy Spirit does at his place. And we are blessed and privileged to be part of this family. So I asked Lord, well, what, what makes us unique? What, what is it that's different? You know, we, don't, we do the real deal here. We don't play church. We don't leave the church and do nothing about the kingdom. We're God's kings, we're God's ambassadors, we're his children down here, and we're soldiers to carry a message of hope and love and peace, no matter what. Because Jesus overcame this world. He said, greater is he that is in you, him than the, he that is in this world. We've got to stand on the truth. We've got to operate in the truth. And that should give us great thanksgiving. So Joe's been talking about the unseen, but we operate in the seen. But we know we're fighting principalities and powers that we don't see. We're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about the storm that they went through when they crossed from Capernaum to go to Decapolis, where the demoniac was. We're going to talk about those things. You know, it's quite possible that that message last week, the devil didn't want it to get recorded. But like I said before, we're going we're to walk through that and make sure it gets done. Because it's his message, not mine and not Joe's. So thankfulness and love should permeate every cell in our body because that's an attraction to the invitations that were given by God. Joe talked about it last week. The unseen invitees to the great banquet that's coming. We all have an invitation to join that banquet, and we have a list of invitations to hand to people so that they can come join that banquet. We're going to talk about those things today. So let's talk about what is it that the Bible says is how we operate, how we should maneuver in this world. This is the reasons why we can fight the battle of the unseen here on earth. We have to put on the full armor of God. So let's look at what causes these things to happen from a biblical perspective. First of all, when we talk about worship, that was tremendous worship. Would you agree? Every t I say that every Sunday. It's like, it's always good. So in the Bible, it says, you were designed and planned for God's pleasure. After all this, there is one thing to say. Have reverence for God and obey his commands because this is why we were created. That's in Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Fellowship. We were formed for a family. It was a happy day for the Father when he gave us our new lives through the truth, truth of his word. And we became, as it were, the first children in his new family. It says that in James. Discipleships. The fellowship at his place is not to be missed. If you don't know about it, come join us. Discipleship. You were created to become like Christ. God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in the line of humanity restored. We see the original intended shape 
of our lives in Jesus. That's in Romans 8.29. We have a motto here that is our mission statement. And we know that it's a perfect place for imperfect people. I love that. The mission statement is changing lives one person at a time through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what we do here. So you were shaped, the ministry, you were shaped for serving God. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepares in advance so that we will walk in them. We do that here. We have, I think, over 26 ministries that we're involved with. If you read the Beatitudes, Jesus said, feed the hungry, home, give homes to the homeless. Heal the sick, find the lost. We're all about dealing with the addicted, the afflicted, the outcast, the marginalized. Those people that other churches don't necessarily want because they're messy. I don't know about you, but I'm messy. I've been redeemed, I've been saved, I've been transformed. I am informed by the word of God so that I can be conformed into the man that he created me to be in the beginning that I messed up. Can I get an amen? All right, I'm glad I'm not alone. So the next piece that makes us part of following the plan and the word of God is evangelism. You were made for a mission. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God promised he'd never leave us, never forsake us. We're going to talk more about that as we go on. So now, so now we know the who, the what, the why, and the where. Who? We are God's kids created in his image and likeness. What? What we do, we obey his word and execute his will. Why? Because his will is truth. That word was in there before someone gave me a word this morning that the God gave her to tell me. It was in there. His will is truth. He is the truth. And Jesus Christ is the living word of God. And his will is always better than ours. That's why. Where? Where do we do this? In the community that God placed you. If you're here, you're here by his design. There's no coincidence or mistakes in God's plan. You're here on purpose for a purpose. Okay, ready? Here is the how. Now that we know these things, Paul writes this. Now may God who gives endurance and who supplies encouragement Grant that you be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. So that, when you hear so that, it's like, this is important. With one accord, you may with one voice glorify and praise and honor the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans 5, 15, 5, 6. It says it right there. It gives encouragement, gives endurance so that we can be of the same mind, with one accord. We're on a mission, ladies and gentlemen. What did Peter say? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected and shielded by the power of God through your faith for salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. That's a mouthful, but oh my gosh, that is so powerful and comforting, right? Peter goes on in this, he says, is this, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. We are going to talk about storms and various trials. Listen to what Peter said. So that 
the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, the unseen, now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of souls. Are you with me? Paul writes this, so then, there's a lot of so that's and so then's because this is incredibly important. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with, one more time, thankfulness, thankfulness. I am so bloody thankful. I am so grateful that Jesus gave me an invitation to his banquet. I'm so grateful that every day should be a moment of thanksgiving. For in him, all the fullness of the deity, the Godhead, dwells in bodily form, completely expressing the divine essence of God. And in him, you have been made complete, achieving spiritual stature through Christ. We are complete through Christ. And he is the head over all rule. Now listen up. He is the head over all rule and authority of every angelic and earthly power. We're going to talk about that in the demoniac and in the storm that they had to traverse to get to dealing with the demons. You with me? So Jesus said in Luke 4, 18, 19, he said, He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set free those who are oppressed. We're going to talk about possessed, and we're also going to talk about oppressed. So this was Jesus' mandate. So, you know, whenever he spoke, the crowds were overwhelming. And you can see this in this picture, if you will. He's standing on the shoreline. Notice behind him there's like no place left to go. So he usually, what he did in this case, was he got into a boat to back up off a shore so that everybody could hear him and see him. So this is right before they're going to take the trip across the lake of Galilee. I don't recall ever reading a single time when Jesus went into a prison, but I do know of times he went to people who were trapped in their own body by the evil that so easily entangles us. To free those who are oppressed. The obvious meaning of oppressed in the scenario of this time frame would be the Roman government, the tax collector, maybe sometimes just what's going on with life. But the deeper meaning is oppressed by spiritual forces that also bind and can blind us. People in torment or possessed like the demoniac. So here you see Jesus is in the boat. He's preaching to the people. And he said, as Jesus began to teach by the lake, the crowd gathered around him and it was, he got into a boat and sat in the lake with people so they could all hear. I believe, well, at this time, while he was teaching the people on shore, it's not in the Bible, by the way, so bear with me. I believe that it was during that time when he was talking of the mysteries of, of the kingdom that he alone heard something calling from the other side of the lake. There was a voice coming from the other side. On that day when evening came, he said to them, now again, this is not written in the Bible, I believe that he heard the voice and he knew he was going over to the other side to deal with what he was going to deal with. I believe, and it could be just my overactive imagination, but I think as they were getting ready to depart and go to the other side, Jesus said to one of the apostles, 
I need another set of clothes. That was a curious request. I need an extra set of clothes, please. Now, no one dare ask him why, but as soon as the clothing was handed to him, he said, let us go over to the other side. They cast off and headed quietly into the darkness. As the men were guiding the boat, Jesus took the opportunity to get some rest. I believe he took the clothes, put it under his head. It says in the Bible, a cushion, okay. Put the clothing under his head and he fell asleep. The reflection, it, the, the, it, picture the lake like glass, full moon shining, and the reflection on the water. It was like a highway for them to go to the other side. Suddenly, there were dark, ominous clouds that came up, and there was a storm coming, and the moon got very, very dim. As if from nowhere, there arose a fierce gale wind and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. If you were in that boat, there's a picture of the boat. You have a picture of the boat? There you go. I'd be freaking out too if the waves were coming over the top of that. But Jesus was sound asleep. So Jesus himself, or himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. They woke him up and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Can you imagine Jesus like, Then he rose. Jesus rose. And notice what it says. In Mark 4.39, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. In Luke, it says this, and he got up and rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped, and it became calm. If you've ever been in any kind of storm, particularly on sea or in a lake, storms don't stop. They subside. They go away over a length of time. There was something different about this storm and why Jesus used the word rebuke that we're going to talk about. And he said to them, now keep in mind, they woke him up and said, don't you care that we're perishing? Like, why are you afraid? Jesus asked them. Do you still have no faith? You know, faith is not an insurance policy that stops or protects us from bad things happening. It's the, faith is the ability to walk through things when they show up because the power of God is overwhelming. So you got the picture of this so far, right? Jesus asked them, do you still have no faith in Mark 4.40? Why do you think he asked them that? Maybe they didn't think that calming the sea was in God's skill set. Maybe they didn't think they had the power to do anything about it. These are great questions. So, when storms in your life come, and whether you like it or not, they will, are you prepared for them or not? It is not a question of whether they're going to come. Faith is how you get through them. And I think that's one of the lessons that we're going to learn today. Remember this, don't ever let a storm, a trial, a tragedy, don't let the presence of that issue cause you to doubt the presence of God. He said he will never leave you, never forsake you. God cannot lie. Never means never. 
He won the victory. Remember, we have ultimately won the victory. Our job is to fight the good fight down here. With what? The powers that he gave us in the heavenlies to fight the battle in the seen and the unseen. And we're going to see that as we continue on here. So again, they said, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Maybe Jesus was asking them, do you really think I was going to let you drown? When you're in the middle of whatever is going on, tragedy, death, whatever it might be, do you really think God is going to let you drown? He said he would never leave you and never forsake you. So, I believe that Jesus was upset with them because all they had was this really set of beliefs, this passive faith that didn't take action. Even though they believed in God, they really didn't think God would help. I can tell you unequivocally that I spent most of my life like that. I always believed in Jesus Christ. I never didn't believe in Jesus Christ. I always believed in the Father, I believed in the crucifixion, I believed in the resurrection. But it was a set of information that I held up here that didn't translate or crystallize into faithful action. Our faith is an active word. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts to bone and marrow. There's nothing stronger than the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So we're going to see how that takes place here. Maybe it's just me, but maybe Jesus expected them to calm the storm. So we're going to jump now to the other side, right? So the minute they get to the other side, a man caught in the crowd called out and said, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. A spirit seizes him and then suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him and is destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. Keep that in mind. Here's Jesus' response. I think he was upset because he was looking and directing this at the apostles. Jesus was looking at his apostles when he said, you have the ability to overcome, you have it in you because I put it in you. He said, you unbelieving perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here, he told the man. Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him into the ground and into convulsions. And you notice how the demons always speak directly to God. They know precisely who he is. But Jesus rebuked the impure spirit, headed the, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father, and they were all amazed at the greatness of God. Let's go back to the storm on the Lake of Galilee. Maybe this was a different storm. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. The same word that he used just now to rebuke the Spirit. Here's what demons say to God. What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. When Jesus saw that the crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit. That's in Mark. The reason I'm showing you this is this word rebuke was used to rebuke the storm and the waves. It was used to rebuke spirits, always used to rebuke unclean spirits. He said this in Mark 8.33, But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. 
For you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. Could it be that there were unseen forces trying to prevent Jesus from getting to where he wanted to go on the Sea of Galilee? Absolutely. So why did they become very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? Really? They've seen, he's seen, they have seen him raise people from the dead, heal the sick. Why would they be afraid? I believe that in Matthew 10.28, they, they realized they had never seen Jesus do what he did that night on the lake. He had never seen, they had never seen him rebuke the wind and the sea and have it absolutely stop. I think they were afraid that they actually realized that he was, in fact, God, the Most High. So, in Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said this, Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. This is just a picture of that travel from on the lake of Galilee. They left from the top where you see Capernaum, and they traveled over to Decapolis. When he got there, this was the other unclean spirit. This is the spirit that Joe talked about last week. Remember, Joe said... The demoniac was answering Jesus' call, or if you will, responding to his invitation. Joe talked about the unseen invitees. If you feel here today and you feel like you're not invited to the kingdom of God, look at this guy. Nobody was more unqualified to enter the kingdom of God than this gentleman. But Jesus had a specific invitation written personally to him. And he delivered it in person, just like he will do with us when we accept his invitation. When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit in him, he had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him anymore because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart. By hand, the shackles broken in pieces. No one was strong enough to subdue him. He hadn't met Jesus before. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and the mountains, gnashing himself with stones. Remember Joe talked about Satan wants to completely stop you from having any relationship with your Heavenly Father, even to the point of deforming your physical body. He was gnashing himself with stones, completely disfiguring himself while indwelling him at the same time. Seeing Jesus, he ran up and bowed down before him. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they would always fall down and shout, you are the son of God. And shouting with a loud voice, he said, what business do you have with each, with, with each other, Jesus, son of most high? I implore you by God, do not torment me. They were imploring him into the command, let them go away, not to go into the abyss. Remember, they always want to have a physical body. They don't want to be disembodied. They're looking for bodies to... He said, what do you want with us, son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed day? It seems to me that demons know Jesus better than some people do. And certainly in my life, I didn't always bow down to the Jesus that I said I knew. I didn't shout out with a clear voice and surrender and love to the Jesus I said I knew. I wasn't possessed, but I certainly was oppressed. Then he will also say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. You believe that there is one God, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. James wrote that in, in James 2.19. 
For he had been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Again, the word rebuke. He was asking him, What is your name? In the Hebrew tradition, a Hebrew exorcism could not be done until the demon identified itself. If the demon struck a person dumb, unable to speak, there was no way the Jews could, the Jews could exorcise it. And they held that the only, the only one, the Messiah, could exercise it. Very quickly, let me show you something. This is what's written in Matthew 9, 32, 33. As they were going out, a mute, couldn't speak, demon-possessed man was brought to him. After the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke. And the, cast, and the crowds were amazed and were saying nothing like he's never seen in Israel before. Jesus rebuked him. There are many demons, but only one devil. Maybe you think that the devil looks like this, but he actually looks like this. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You are corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. He was the most anointed cherub. What got in his way? His pride. He wanted to be higher than God. That's why he got thrown out. Do you know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 3.16 A Christian can be oppressed by a demon but not possessed. It's important. A Christian can be tempted by a demon. Satan tempts you with desires. But here's the antidote. The truth serum. The Beatitudes. Jesus came to this earth, and all he came to do was serve. The first recorded words of Jesus in the Bible are, I came to do my Father's will. When he was going to the cross and he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was praying to the Father, saying, Father, if there is any way this cup can be removed from me, please do so, but not my will, thy will be done. On this earth, there's nothing I decide I desire besides you, David wrote. A Christian can be knocked down, but he can never be knocked out. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that, there's that so that again, the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. You can say to the devil anytime, you didn't make me, so you can't break me. In the name of Jesus Christ. You are God. Little children have overcome, because great is he who is in you than he who is in this world. When you have Jesus, you have power. They could have rebuked the sea. Why didn't they? They could have said, not today, Satan. You're not messing with this boat ride. We got something to do on the other side. And by the way, Jesus is asleep. And it began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. So here we go back to the story. And Jesus said, how about let me, how about they asked him, how about letting me go into the swine? How about let me go over there into those pigs? And Jesus said, okay. I like deviled ham. I like deviled ham. Okay. Jesus gave them permission, and coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. Can you imagine 6,000 spirits, which is a legion, coming out of the man and going into 2,000 pigs, running into the water and drowning themselves? I think that might scare the unbelievers, the Gentiles in the area of Decapolis. How about you? So the herdsmen ran away and reported in the city and the country that people came to see what had happened. Here's what happened. They came to see Jesus and, and they observed the man who had been demon-possessed sitting down, clothed in his right mind. Remember, he didn't have clothes on when they came. Remember I told you it was my imagination that God said, bring me a set of clothes. He slept on that clothes on the boat ride when... The storm went crazy because the devil was trying to stop Jesus from getting to the other side to mess with his demons. Are you with me? The legions were gone. The man was in his right mind. 
and he was sitting in front of God, and he was clothed. He was in his right mind. What's the point? What is the point? What is the point of all this? Whatever storm you're going through, whatever trial or tribulation is happening in your life, Jesus has a plan for you that overcomes whatever's going on. He's already defeated the enemy. We have victory. Excuse me. We have victory through Christ Jesus. Jesus brought the worst out of that man, so now we could bring the best out of that man. Our testimony, the invitations we have, we talk about who we used to be, then we met Jesus, and now we're somebody different. We testify of the power of God in our lives to share an invitation with somebody else. Those who had seen it described how it happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine. That got reported to thousands of people. And they began to implore him to leave their region. They were so scared, they were so upset that they just lost 2,000 pigs that I'm sure they were afraid that Jesus was going to do something else to their economy. And they said, please leave. Jesus always came when asked. He also always left when he was asked. Is it possible to hear the gospel for the last time? Interesting question. Sadly, yes. It seems at the end of the day, the only one who was not afraid, picture this, thousands of people in Decapolis, everybody there is afraid except one man. The one who had been possessed and freed from the demons. Now get this picture, right? Now they're going to leave. Jesus is getting ready to leave that area because they asked him to. Jesus was getting into the boat the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him. Can you imagine? Please, Jesus, take me with you. Lord, Jesus, please take me with you. What did Jesus say? He said to him, go home to your people and report to them the great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. That's the message to each and every one of us. We come to a church, to fellowship, to have ministry, to discipleship, and we worship him. When we leave this building, our job is to go out there and report to the dead, the dying, the destitute, the poor, the addicted, the afflicted, the sick, what Jesus has done in your life. Can I get an amen? That's what gives us great thanksgiving. God has done something in our lives that we want to share with other people. Overwhelming, never endless, reckless love of God with inexpressible joy. We sing about it every Sunday. Do we just sing about it, leave the building, and not carry it with us out there? I hope not. If there's anyone in here tonight, today, that has not met Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, he has an invitation for you to join the family of God, to be at that great banquet at the end of time and enjoy the most outrageous, incredible, insane banquet of the entire kingdom. Guess what? We also we probably don't gain any weight. We can eat all the goodies and not gain weight. So if you're here today, and this is your first time here, or you're coming back, and you haven't met Jesus, you haven't accepted the invitation that he has for you, that he wrote in his blood, that he went to the cross, died for your sins, and rose from the dead. I want the church to pray along with us, and please raise your hand if you want to meet Jesus today, if you haven't met him before. We're going to say a prayer. I see your hand. We're going to say a prayer, and we're going to ask God, to, if you will, come into us and change us from the inside out so that we can carry the message of hope and faith and love in truth, in truth, with the power of the Holy Spirit when we leave this building to be a person that is a game changer out there. Do you want to be a game changer? Because if we want to change the game, we got to play by God's rules and not ours. That's the whole message of this story about what the apostles failed to do in the midst of that storm. And Jesus said, 
you have the power to do that. So pray with me now, church. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth and paid for my sins on the cross and rose from the dead. And you said that I am saved if I say that with my mouth and believe it in my heart. I now declare by saying that that I am saved and I am part of your family. We do the unseen business down here in the seen world. And we thank you that you give us all the power to do that. We pray your blessings upon us, Lord God. And we ask that you guide us and direct us in every word, thought, and action that comes out of our mouth. Be called according to your purpose and your word, driven by your power of your Holy Spirit. And we thank you for what you want to do in our lives already and what you want to do in our lives in the future. We thank you for this day. We pray that you would help us to make every day Thanksgiving, every day a celebration of Christmas, and every day a celebration of Easter and the resurrection of our risen Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.